Good morning, everyone. Welcome to East White Oak Bible Church, where we are seeking to be worshipers maturing in Christ. And one of the ways that we measure how well we're doing at worshiping is one of our vital signs is being rooted in Scripture, and that's the focus of our time this morning. You know, I've often been fond of saying that Bible is the middle name of East White Oak Bible Church. I like that. And I think that the psalmist in Psalm 119 would like it too. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 46, is where I want to direct our attention to prepare our hearts for worship. Hear what Psalm 119, beginning at verse 46, says. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame, for I find delight in your commandments which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. And nearly every verse of Psalm 119 has some reference to the scriptures. Uh, it's 176 verses long of this praise of God's re written revelation. This morning we're going to be thinking about what it means to speak to proclaim this good news of the Scriptures. Let's pray. Now, Lord, we invite your presence with us. Inhabit the praise of your people. Open our eyes to the beauty and the wonders found in the Bible. And I pray that we would not just be informed, but changed by its power, by its work in our hearts to the end that you would be glorified and we, your church, would be more effective, both worshipers of you and heralds of the good news about Jesus to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning to you. Would you stand and let's sing to our King this morning.
a new song this morning. It's called When Christ Our Life Appears. Uh, wonderful words to this one as we look forward uh, to the return of our King. So sing when you're comfortable. That's a new song with some ancient words. It comes from Colossians chapter 3, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with Him in glory. Oh, what a beautiful treasure that uh, section of Scripture is. Uh, many of you know about my brother Jim and the battle with cancer that he's facing. Carol and I went to visit him and his wife Kathy uh, last Thursday, and I just want to say that he's living out Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Uh, his 
mind is set on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Uh, he has his uh, focus set on who Jesus is and what he's done for him. Uh, you know, this kind of thing is so important because we don't have the, uh, when, the, when the moment of trial comes, we don't have time to get ready. We are either ready or we are not. And just the wonder of how Jim's, the fullness of his life and faith in Christ is being revealed by this trial is, is beautiful. Uh, as an older brother, I don't want to say that my younger brother ever teaches me anything. But I did tell him, you're teaching me how to live and you're teaching me how to die. Jim's passion is that he would grow greater in thanksgiving and that he would grow in the effectiveness of his witness so that here in the last chapter of his life, he's able to win more people to Christ than he's even done in his whole life. Isn't it amazing? I just am so thankful for a testimony like that. Now, uh, some of you may be aware that there is an eclipse tomorrow. I don't know if you heard, but I thought before we pray that I would talk a little bit about that because sometimes people want to make some prophetic statement about eclipses, and I just want to say that I don't think they relate to anything having to do with the end of the age. Um, when people make comments like that, they end up looking silly, and more importantly, it can make the truth of Bible prophecy look silly, so it's not a small matter making a wrong case for coming judgment because it leads people to doubt coming judgment at all. Um, there are people who look at Joel chapter 2 and say that they re that refers to eclipses, but those verses are not referring to common astronomical phenomena. Uh, they refer to unusual, never-before-seen astronomical events. Um, the fact is that there is a total eclipse of the sun once, on average, every 18 months somewhere in the world. And so to think that because we have one happening to us, it means something special, uh, tells us something about how our view of prophecy may be more self-centered than it should be. Uh, it's easy for us all to think of ourselves more importantly than we should, isn't it? Uh, so here's my advice. Enjoy the eclipse and the wonders of God's created universe. If you go, just be patient traveling back because it will be crowded. Uh, what I hear is it's the, it will be the largest migration of Americans in history. So there you go. Have fun. Um, but don't make a prophetic, big prophetic deal out of it. Uh, those are the same kinds of things that would cause people to think all kinds of things are the end of the world and they're wrong and they'll be wrong here and it could cause people to disparage the truth of the prophetic scriptures. There will be an end to this age and people need to be awakened to coming judgment. But the eclipse isn't the way to do that. Instead, let's let the Bible speak plainly. Acts chapter 17 the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Let the resurrection be the testimony of coming judgment rather than some astronomical phenomena. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, my brother Jim, the privilege I had to be with him, it was like being on holy ground. He has his mind so fixed on heavenly things. It's a privilege. I pray that you would grow him in his increasing thanksgiving and in his testimony for you that the people that are uh, in his orbit who do not know the Savior, that they would all come to know him um, so that the people that become Believers through his testimony in his death would be even more than all the ones he has led to the Lord in his life. I pray for Kathy that you would watch over her, sustain their family and strengthen them. 
with each new thing that happens, I pray you would be readying them and preparing them that your hand of blessing would be upon them. Thank you for their ministry a few years ago here at East White Oak, and we ask for that to continue to bear fruit in our lives of how Jim urged us just to do the next thing in terms of reaching out to people, that we didn't have to do it all at once, but just to do the next thing that the Lord is asking us to do. So we pray for that. Lord, I want to pray today for people in our church body who are facing challenges. I think of Dave Halteman and the challenge he's had with uh, uh, lung issues, uh, pneumonia and uh, bronchitis. I'm thankful that he's getting better, but I pray for him that he would not have any setbacks and that you would watch over him and Barb. We love them and pray your blessing upon them. We pray the same for Doris Howard, asking that you would help her to recover uh, from her uh, fall and that she would be able to go back home. We would pray earnestly for that. Lord, I want to pray for uh, Diane Ferencrug and her diagnosis of breast cancer. Would you visit her in a very special way with your presence and guide her and Bill as they walk this path together. Be near to them and fulfill your work in them, Lord, in this. And that they would too would have this profound sense of your presence with them all along the way. And Lord, I pray for complete healing for Diane uh, from this. Lord, we want to lift up our missionaries today. We especially want to pray for Gary Blunier, who is in Thailand, where he tore a quad tendon in a fall and is needing to return to the U.S. ahead of schedule. I pray you would pave the way for him to be able to get back to the U.S. Uh, and that he'd be able to get this repaired uh, and it would go well so that he can have the, sh the shoulder surgery that he's scheduled to have. Lord, please watch over Gary and bless him, Lord. And then we want to remember Bill and Debbie Miller in Argentina. Uh, their town has been uh, hit with a huge uh, problem with dengue fever. And I know this is happening all over the world, Lord. And so I pray particularly for the people of Mendoza and for Bill and Debbie that you would protect them from this and that it would the disease would dissipate, and I pray that you would protect Bill and Debbie in the midst of this as well. Now, Lord, as we uh, open your word and as we sing, as we uh, would hear these words that Andrew's going to share about the next steps that people can take in their connection here with East White Oak, I pray that you would be glorified and honored through it all that we would walk away from here saying, we have met with the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We do have one more song to sing, but before we do that, I just want to extend a special welcome to any guests that are with us this morning. We're so glad you're here. Um, to that end, if you would begin a text conversation with us, we'd love it if you text the, the words EWOBC to 77411. Um, we would be happy to reach out to you and start a conversation there. Also, our Welcome Center staff, which is out these doors and to the left, would be happy to meet you. They can answer any questions that you might have after the service. Our Pastor Scott will also be down to my right afterwards if you'd like to talk with him after the service as well. The church's website, eastwhiteoak.church, um, is a great place to find all the activities that are happening. Um, also in the e-bulletin, there'll be all those details and more and links to online registrations. That comes to your inbox on Thursdays. If you'd like to sign up for that e-bulletin, just text those same letters, EWOBC, to 77411. And lastly, if you came prepared to joyfully give, you can use the black and white connection boxes at the back, or you can give on the church's website at eastwhiteoak.church. Just click the Give tab. Okay, let's stand. Let's sing once again, Only Holy God. Thank you. 
From time to time, a, a pastor is asked to speak at a funeral for someone he does not know. Uh, some stranger doesn't have any church affiliation. The family wants to have a pastor speak at the funeral. And uh, that happened to me. Uh, it's happened to me quite a few times, but in this particular occasion, it was someone who had been murdered. Uh, they were the operator of this little tiny hole-in-the-wall pizza place, and on a Monday night, they happened to have $6,000 in receipts, which doesn't add up to the number of pizzas they could have possibly sold, so there's a little mystery there. Uh, the person is found dead, and uh, I go to the visitation then, having been asked to be involved with the family, and at the visitation, I felt like I was in the middle of an Agatha Christie novel. And I felt like Perot saying, one of the people in this room is a murderer. You know. uh, the murderer has remained unsolved to this day. Uh, but the next morning when I came to the funeral, I was there a little bit ahead of time, and the person who was the spokesman for the family uh, came up to me and looked me right in the eye, and he said, I, uh, you probably figured out that we're not church-going folks around here. And I said, yeah, I can tell that. And he said, so what we, we want to make sure that you don't do any preaching today in this service. And I said, well, what I thought I would do is talk about heaven and hell and how a person can know that they're going to heaven and how they can know that they can escape hell. And he put his hands on my shoulders and looked me in the eye and he goes, that'd be just great. <laughs> I was not about to assume that his definition of preaching was the same definition I had of preaching. This morning we're going to look at a text that says, preach the word. I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. And we're going to look about at this idea of preaching. Now, Paul's speaking to Timothy here. So, Timothy's a pastor and Paul is mentoring him. So, this is a clear word to a pastor. As such, we can extend it out to all pastors for all time. That's how they are to do their ministry. But the fact that it's in the Scriptures tells me that there's application not just to Timothy, and not just to pastors, but there's application here in how every believer should live and conduct their ministry here in this world. So, as we read this, don't think, oh, this isn't for me. It's for you, and it's for me in a couple of different ways. One of them is as a pastor, and it is something that we can take and embrace. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Please have a seat. Gospel Words for Gospel People is how we've entitled this series, and here we come to this passage that is about the proclaiming of the gospel, the preaching, the heralding of the gospel. When we think of preaching, we think of that done by a pastor, but know that this word is used for just anyone who is announcing the gospel 
or sharing the good news. So there's lots of ways in which we can ap apply this text. Uh, in verse 1, we have this solemn charge. We are to keep faithful to the gospel, knowing that we are responsible to God. This almost sounds like a courtroom kind of, do you swear to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. There's a solemn charge. Yes to Timothy, yes to pastors, yes to all of us. In fact, the word that's used here of charge is the word of used of testifying in court. This is a charge before God and Christ Jesus. It's an interesting construction because it's putting God and Christ Jesus in such close identity and relationship. This is something Paul loves to do because he wants people to know there's one God and he exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So wherever he gets the chance, he'll put God the Father and Jesus Christ grammatically in close proximity. In fact, you could possibly translate this phrase, I charge you, in the presence of God, even Jesus Christ, the one who is to judge the living and the dead. Close proximity. The charge, therefore, is before the one to whom all of us will one day give an account. He's going to judge the living and the dead. No one will escape that. Paul knows that he's about to die. Um, he expects Timothy to keep on living. Both of them will give an account to the judge of all. Now, there's three clear and certain expectations that guided Paul's challenge here. First, Christ is at the brink of judging. He is to judge the living and the dead. Secondly, Christ is at the brink of His appearing again, by His appearing. Third, Christ is at the brink of inaugurating His final kingdom. In view of all of that, we come to the command, preach the word. So, understand that there's three clear expectations Paul has. Jesus is the judge. He's going to appear again, and His kingdom is coming. And as a result of that, as the judge of the living and the dead, there's a solemn charge for us all to fulfill. There's some applications that we can draw here. First, preaching, what pastors do, is not ultimately based on the needs of people. Now, it doesn't mean that we should be ignorant of the needs of people. It doesn't mean that we should not be sympathetic toward them or that we shouldn't even address them once in a while. But ultimately, the proclamation of the gospel is not based on the needs of people. And when you share your faith with others, you should be sensitive to their needs and so on, but it's not ultimately about their needs. It's about the gospel, about God. Secondly, preaching is not ultimately based on the responses of people. Sometimes we think that, oh, well, I shared my faith, nothing happened, and so I guess I'm not cut out for this. The proclamation of the gospel is not ultimately based on how people respond or don't. On my way to church this morning, my wife Carol was telling me about an encounter she had with a person at Walmart yesterday. She was sharing the gospel with this fellow, and she said to me as she was describing their encounter, as she concluded her response, she said, you know, it just didn't feel like there was anything there. It just didn't happen, you know. Now, we don't know whether there was something happening or not, but she didn't feel it. I will tell you, though, I guarantee you that this is not going to stop Carol from proclaiming the good news about Jesus. In fact, it won't stop her from doing so at Walmart, 
And in fact, it won't stop her from re-engaging this fellow that, she, that works there. <laughs> Why? Because preaching is not based on the responses of people. When I say preaching, I don't just mean what a pastor does in the service. It's also what you and I do every day when we share our faith. Thirdly, preaching or proclaiming the gospel is not ultimately based on how we feel about it. You know, some days we feel really charged up and ready to go, and sometimes we don't feel it, right? Sometimes we feel like we're you know, really able to connect and can be, you know, smooth in how we talk and all that. And some days we just are stumbling around. Preaching or sharing the Word of God is not ultimately based on how we feel about it. So it's not based on the needs of people. It's not based on the responses of people. It's not based on how we feel about it. Instead, the proclamation of God's Word is based on Christ Jesus, our commander, about to judge us, about to appear again on earth, and about to establish his kingdom. This was the commitment that motivated the early apostles. One of the best examples of that is Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 10, where he says, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Do you see how Peter's message is almost exactly the same as what Paul is urging Timothy to do? In view of the fact that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead, in view of his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Proclaim it. The hour is late. Our Lord Jesus is watching. Now let's come to the command specifically in verse 2. Preach the word. Keeping faithful to the gospel requires knowing what the gospel is. Uh, And he says preach the word. Before we even get into what that means, I just want to share with you that there have been seasons and times in human history when God has made his word scarce. It's very easy for us to think, oh, we'll always have the Bible, we can always do it, it'll always be access, always, always, always. no. There have been seasons and times in human history when God has made his word scarce scarce. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1, now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Or Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 and that's, we're like 300 years after Samuel and it says, behold the days are coming declares the Lord God when I will send a famine on the land Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. God can make his word scarce, so we should not presume that it will always be around. With that in mind, this urgency then that Paul gives to Timothy, preach 
the word, herald the word, boldly proclaim it. The focus here is not on defending the word of God, rather it is the simple proclaiming of it. Sometimes when we are about to share our faith with someone, we get, we get talked out of it by ourselves by saying, well, if they ask me a question, I probably won't know the answer, so I just won't say anything. It's not about being able to defend it. It's about proclaiming. Be ready in season and out of season, alert for opportunity, eager to tell it, but mostly this sense of urgency and insistence. I think all too frequently, don't we take no for an answer? Oh, they won't be interested in hearing what I have to say before we even share the question. Richard Baxter, the famous Puritan, wrote in the Reformed Pastor, whatever you do, let people see that you're in good earnest. You cannot break men's hearts by jesting with them or telling them a smooth tale or patching up a gaudy oration. Men will not cast away their dearest pleasures upon a drowsy request of one that seemeth not to mean as he speaks or to care much whether his request is granted. There's an urgency here. Preach the word. Um, it says to be ready in season and out of season, alert for opportunity, eager to tell it. Uh, did you know that there's going to be convenient times for us to share the gospel and there's going to be inconvenient times for us? That's what it means to be ready in season and out of season. When it's convenient, when people are ready to listen, when it's inconvenient, people may not be ready to listen. And I want to share with you that even though you may be feeling weary, that people, nobody anywhere is responding to the gospel, I want to share some good news with you. Did you know that every second there are two new believers in the world? Every second? Did you know that over the last 10 years, over three quarters of a billion people have become believers? That every day, more than 260,000 people are presented the plan of salvation? That the average number of people added to the body of Christ is 174,000 every day? That every week, 3,500 new churches are opening around the globe? So, there's reason, even as we have reason for even our doubts and is anybody listening, is anybody responding, I just share those statistics with you to say, but there's reason for optimism as well. And whether optimism or pessimism, be ready in season and out of season. And then there's three ways in which we are to herald this word of God, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Reprove means to convince, that is to have some intellectual foundation to what we're doing. But even as I say that, understand that I'm not calling, nor is Paul, saying that we have to be brainiacs in order to share the hope we have. Let me tell you something about these people who are highly intellectual. Highly intellectual people suffer from the same problem that everybody has. And that problem is one of the will, not of the mind. They're coming up with intellectual arguments to oppose God's word, not because those things are the big sticklers in their mind. They are coming up with those things because they don't want to believe. That's the issue. It's an issue of the will more than of the mind. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't come up with someone, someone asks us a question and we don't know the answer, say, you know, that's a great question, I don't know the answer, I'll go look it up for you. Let me see if I can't come up with some answers for you. But then it might be worthwhile to ask the question, if I answer this question to your complete satisfaction, will you then repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Savior? And the answer likely will be no, because the issue is one of the will rather than of the mind. To demonstrate that, let me share with you two different philosophers. 
One is Aldous Huxley, who in his writing Ends and Means wrote this, I had motive for not wanting the world to have a meaning, consequently assumed that it had none, and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. You understand, it's what he wants, it's his will that's determining how he's going to think. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics. He's not really interested in just the arcane intellectual exercise. He's also concerned to prove that there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do or why his friends should not seize political power and govern in the way that they find most advantageous to themselves. For myself, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation, sexual and political. You see, this is one of the great intellectuals of our day, and he could come up with all kinds of reasons why he didn't want to believe the Bible. You could satisfy them all, and it would not satisfy Huxley. Why? Because he wanted to live as he well pleased. That's what it was about. Or how about a more modern philosopher, New York uh, uh, University philosopher Thomas Hegel, who said, I want atheism to be true and, may, and, was, and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope that there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. You see, the issue is the will. So while we are to reprove or convince, be aware that what we're seeking to do is to be partnered with the Holy Spirit in such a way that He will take the Word and convince, okay? Then there's this idea of rebuke. The moral imperative, telling what God's Word says even and especially where it challenges modern and postmodern norms. That doesn't make you always very popular, but that is what God is charging through the Apostle Paul, the pastor, and indeed I believe every believer to engage in. And then thirdly, the word exhort means to encourage, an, an emotional appeal, to say, I, I charge you, I encourage you, I urge you. Just this week, I was, uh, this, this week was really a tough one on me. I, uh, one of the guys that I had served with for 15 years in a church in pastoral ministry has also received a terminal cancer diagnosis. He spent the night with Carol and me Monday night, and um, he was telling me about a person that he uh, is gonna, was going to be seeing in the next day or two who had professed faith in Christ, but she had deconstructed her faith and she wasn't a believer anymore and she rejected it. But she still really, really has a high regard and affection for my friend Ron. And so I said to Ron, I said, when you see her, tell her, hear the words of a dying man. The faith that you are rejecting is true. And you should embrace Christ and trust Him and He'll forgive you of all your sins. You see, there is this place for this last word here of, ex of, of exhort or encourage, make an emotional appeal. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that it's only emotional, but it does mean that it could sometimes be used by God to break through that hardened crust of the will. Now, we do this with complete patience, it says here in verse 2. Uh, the urgency of the hour can sometimes cause us to seize upon people and feel like we've got to dump the whole truckload. <laughs> uh, Paul says, no, 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 we, shouldn't be, we should not fail to be patient with people and patient with the Holy Spirit's work. Sometimes we 
kind of filled up with the Word, and then we're ready to just kind of dump it and remember patience, okay? Don't have to tell everything you know all in one spot. Then do this with complete teaching. There has to be a systematic teaching of the Word of God. Here, understand that that means something for pastors. How will those new believers every two seconds be taught? How will those 3,500 new churches every week be instructed? Christianity must increasingly heed Paul's words here, especially in missions. Teaching, complete teaching, is what the West can give to the growing church in Asia, Central South America, and Africa. It's why we, as our, part of our missions ministry, seek to raise up people who we can send to provide theological education where it's so needed in other parts of the world. So, here's some applications in thinking about keeping faithful to the gospel, knowing what the gospel is. First, the central focus of our worship must be that we directly hear from God. And the only way that that can be faithfully done on a weekly basis is by the systematic exposition of Scripture. What I mean by that is taking a text of Scripture and explaining the meaning and application of the text of the Bible going verse by verse. We know that we're hearing from God that way. Likewise, the central focus of our mission must be to herald news directly from God. And the only way that that can be done is by the patient teaching of the Word of God. People can miss the gospel if we get in too big a hurry to get through it. And I've made that mistake in my life where I've just kind of summarized the gospel really quickly and I feel like they didn't really understand because I was in too big a hurry. Second application is that there is an authority in the expository preaching that cannot exist otherwise. There's an authority in the church where the Word of God is paramount. To be sure that authority will be challenged and resisted, sometimes it'll be resisted as antiquated, misogynistic, hate-filled, unaffirming, and worse. But it is precisely because the Word of God has such power that it will be resisted so strongly. You know, the fact is that there's a lot of people these days that are saying, if only Bible-believing Christians would just get out of the way or get on with the program, all of the problems of the world could be solved. There simply are not enough Bible-believing Christians, especially in urban areas of our nation, to blame them for everything that goes wrong. But that won't keep people from blaming Christians, will it? Even where it comes from a rural church on an isolated corner in the middle of corn and soybeans, there will be resistance to a message that thunders, thus says the Lord. Now let's look at the next few verses here. Keeping faithful to the gospel requires urgency and knowing what the true meaning of the word success is. Uh, he says in verse 3 that there's a time coming when people will not endure sound teaching. There's a hardness that develops, both within the professing church and out in the culture at large. But I think Paul's addressing specifically to Timothy that in the church this is going to happen. And the problem here, as Paul describes it, is not with the preacher, it's with the hearers, that people will not endure sound teaching. They will turn away from listening to the truth. Notice the emphasis on ears and listening. Itching ears. What an apt description for the longing to hear teaching that justifies oneself, or that justifies false belief, or justifies immoral behavior. They will gather teachers to suit their own passions, telling them what they want to hear. Teaching of their own liking, verse 3. Wandering off into myths, verse 4. You know, sadly, today, one of the ways in which that kind of breaks out is the criterion by which teachers or pastors are judged. Most of the time, it's judged by this question. 
do I like his teaching? And people go, oh yeah, I like his teaching. Instead of this question, does he teach the scriptures? People make a decision what they want to hear and they select teachers who will give them what they want. This is never more true than today where many in the church seem to be more interested in how woke or unwoke the preacher is. It cuts both directions. Or how engaged or not he is in politics, be it conservative or liberal politics. Or what politics he holds to. My friends, the most important eternal human relationship that we have is the relationship that a believer in Jesus has with the body of Christ, the church. Some people, thankfully, not many here, make decisions on where they connect in their most important eternal human relationship, the church, not on the basis of doctrine, not on the basis of sound teaching from Scripture, not on the fidelity of that church to Scripture, but rather on things like, well, I like their music, or I like their youth group, or I like their COVID protocols. The coming election season will reveal similar passions. Whatever the varied approaches to the politics of the moment, let us determine here and now that we are people who will go with the Bible, not our own passions. That we will be willing to hear preachers tell us not just what we want to hear, but what the Bible insists that we hear. Now, Timothy is described through the New Testament as sort of a timid fellow. I can't imagine how Timothy would have read this and not been like, <gasps> you're putting all that on me? It might sh cause a teacher to shrink back from teaching anything at all. But that's not the call for those who are faithful to the gospel. Look at verse 5. As for you, Paul says to Timothy... As for you, you live, act, and teach differently. And then he describes four ways to keep faithful to the gospel. First, be sober-minded. Be steady, calm, not chasing every trendy fancy. And boy, if there is anything that, described the mo that describes the modern American church, it's that, chasing trendy fancies. And what's funny is, I've been around long enough that the trendy fancy in one decade is looked upon in the next decade as, well, that was awful. I don't know why anybody was doing that, you know. Endure suffering. When biblical teaching is unpopular, do not stop, especially at those points where the gospel gives the most offense. We shouldn't be deliberately offensive. But we ought deliberately to teach the truth of the Bible and not be frightened of the consequences. Do the work of an evangelist. Make sure that you don't get caught up in silly arguments and unimportant controversies. Paul's saying instead keep pressing forward with the proclaiming of the gospel to people who are not believers yet. Do the work of an evangelist. And then the last one there fulfill your ministry. Don't quit. Don't be deterred by a lack of response. And don't get proud where there is a big response. Simply fulfill your ministry. You know, John Calvin in his commentary on this verse said this, the more determined men become to despise the teaching of Christ, the more zealous should godly ministers be to assert it and the more strenuous their efforts to preserve it entire, and more than that, by their diligence to ward off Satan's attacks. Preachers all through church history have done such things. I'll introduce you to another fellow from right after the apostolic period, a guy with kind of a funny name. His name is Polycarp. Isn't that an interesting name, Polycarp. 
he was a disciple of the Apostle John. Um, Although he was a great preacher and a great pastor, maybe his greatest contribution to Christianity was his death. Uh, The emperors of Rome had unleashed bitter attacks against Christians during this period, and um, members of the early church recorded many of the persecutions and deaths. Polycarp was arrested on the charge of being a Christian, a member of a politically dangerous cult whose rapid growth needed to be stopped. In the middle of an angry mob, the Roman proconsul took pity on a gentle old man and urged Polycarp to proclaim, Caesar is Lord. If only Polycarp would say that and offer a small pinch of incense to Caesar's statue, he would escape torture and death. Here's how Polycarp responded to such an offer. Eighty and six years I have served him. And he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. And then he said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour so that in the company of the martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. Robert Moffat was a missionary in more modern times, late 1700s to 1883, compared to Polycarp, modern, to us, still ancient, right? He was the father-in-law of David Livingston and and a missionary to Africa. He said this, oh, that I had a thousand lives And a thousand bodies, all of them should be devoted to no other employment but to preach Christ to these degraded, despised, yet beloved mortals. Now, he was speaking of the people that he was living with, but understand it's the same group of people you live with, degraded, despised, but beloved mortals. Let us herald the good news. Now you may think, well, wait a minute, I'm not a Polycarp or a Robert Moffat or a John Calvin. What are you expecting out of me, Scott? What's God expecting out of me? Understand that just take the next step in proclaiming the Word of God. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It's how we treasure the gospel and God's Word that can have a deeper impact than we could ever imagine. I want to conclude my message by telling this story. I think I've told it before, but it's worth sharing again to help you understand the power of our affection for God's Word. Many of you know that my wife Carol's mother was killed in an auto uh, collision. There was a man who was high on crack cocaine, in a stolen vehicle, fleeing police in the middle of the day. He ran the red light and hit my mother-in-law and ushered her into heaven. Because it was such a dramatic death, it made a pretty big splash in the local news. And so at my mother-in-law's visitation, there was a lady who came up to Carol, my wife, and she said, you don't know me, I only met your mother once. We were sharing a labor room at the hospital when you were born. And I looked over at this lady. We're both in labor. We're both in a lot of pain. But she took a book out of her purse. And the way she held it and read it, I discerned that it was the Bible. And though we never spoke of it, I was determined that when I got out of the hospital, I was going to learn about that book so that I could see whatever it is that that lady had such an affection for. She said, I joined a Bible study after I had my baby, and I became a Christian. And I now share that same affection that your mother had for the Scripture. 
And the son that I raised that was born the same day as you, he's a pastor now. Never disparage small things we do to proclaim Christ. The lady said, I came because I saw this in the news, and though we had never met ever since, I wanted your family to know the impact of your mother's testimony in her affection for the Word of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your Word. I pray that it would have a, a, such the same impact on every one of us and that we would see in it words of life. And I pray that those who've never put their faith in Christ would do that that they would see that there's a good news here. Yes, there's a judge, and we are sinners, but we can escape that judgment by trusting what Jesus did at the cross to forgive us of our sin. And so, Lord, I pray all over this room, anyone who's never put their faith in Christ would do it right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I, I believe what you did at the cross to forgive me of my sin. I turn from that sin, I turn to you. I believe you rose from the dead, and so I believe you will take me to be with you forever. I'm not trusting anything of my own. I'm trusting you, Jesus, and your death for my sins to save me. Lord, uh, help us all who do know and love the Savior to proclaim the Word of God in, every, in, a, in any and every way that you call us to, and may your Spirit so accompany your word that we may see a great harvest. For your glory, we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. It's so good that we can share in this table that we're about to share in. It's the table of the Lord. It's where we remember what Jesus did in dying for us. The, the bread that we share in is something that we do together to say we remember the body of the Lord Jesus that was broken for us. We take up the cup to remind us Jesus' blood was shed for us. The bread and the cup do not become the body of Christ or the blood of Christ again. We know he died once for all, okay? But what this is is a reminder to us of just the impact that Jesus Christ has had on our lives. As such, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're welcome at this table. If you're still thinking about it, you haven't trusted Christ, I would encourage you to do one of two things. First, this is my best advice, trust Jesus right now. And then you'll be able to take up this cup and this bread with joy. And if you aren't quite ready to do that, please just let it pass because it's designed for those who are embracing Christ to forgive them of their sins to remember what he's done for them. That's the scriptural instruction. Oh Lord, as we take up this bread and cup, please help us so to worship you together. Help us to enjoy the communion of the saints as they gather at this table. Help us to have the vertical moment of worship with our Creator. Help us not to think in isolation, but with one another, and then also with you, that our fellowship may be rich and sweet in this moment of remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Through Christ we pray, amen. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then? Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take and eat this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, you sent Jesus, the one and only Son, to perish so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you that it is the blood of your Son that purifies us from all sin. We take up this cup now as a recognition, as a remembrance of what Jesus did for us in the shedding of his blood. In his name we pray, amen. For to do to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now who is there to harm you, even if you are zealous for what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, brothers and sisters, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Would you stand for this good word? This is a verse that I pray very frequently for my children and grandchildren. It's a verse that I pray for you as well. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.